Well, good morning. Uh, we are in a new sermon series that Drew Peterson kicked off last week called Back to the Basics. We had been in Amos, and uh, during the ministry year, we like to dive into, you know, different specific topics and parts of the Bible, have a little dip in maybe a, a, a book of the Bible over the summer. We did Colossians last summer, we did Amos this summer, and, uh, and we wanted to jump into some basics, some fundamentals, just to remind ourselves of the foundations of our faith, that if we're followers of Jesus, there's just some basic things that we do, and hopefully we can add on to that as we grow and mature, but there's these basic things that we do. And so even if we've been at this for 40, 50, 60 years, it's a good chance to be able to remind ourselves of some of these basics. And in particular, we're looking at what it looks like to have our life with God, that when we talk about what it means to do discipleship, to actually follow Jesus, there are multiple dimensions to that followership, that discipleship. There's the relationship with God, there's that relationship with ourselves, there's that relationship with others, both through fellowship and through God's mission in the world. And out of all those dimensions, over these five weeks, we're looking specifically at the, that vertical dimension, what it looks like to have that relationship with God. And so, over that time, we're covering, uh, if you joined us last week, it was about Sabbath and what it means to just sort of rest in God. And this week, solitude, what it means to be alone with God. Next week, scripture, what it means to be in God's word. The 25th what it means to obey his sermons to us. It's not about just our sermons, his sermon. And, uh, and then September 1st, what it means to continue to seek him. So um, some cute little S alliteration, which I don't normally do, but there it is. Um, so yeah, so this week, it's being alone with the Father. We're going to look at passages from Luke 5 and Luke 6. Before we do that, let's pray. Lord, we're uh, grateful, we're humbled to have the privilege to come and worship you in song, to come and uh, through prompts and silent reflection to reflect a little bit on our relationship with you. And now as we come to your word, we open ourselves up to you, even um, for those that aren't ready to open themselves up to you. I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would work in us, crack open any hard shells or any cold hearts um, melt us down so that we might be shaped and formed and reformed into who you want us to be. <sighs> May it be so. And all your people say, amen. So you can either follow along on the screen or just listen. This is from the ESV, Luke chapter 5. Why, while he, Jesus, was in one of the cities... There came a man full of leprosy, and when he saw Jesus, he fell on his feast, feet, oh, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he, and he charged him to tell no one, but go and show, your, show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now, even more, the report about him went abroad, and crowd, great crowds gathered to hear him, Jesus, and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. And then he goes off, and he performs some more ministry, brings a few more disciples to himself, and then picking it up at verse 12 of chapter 6. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. This is the word of the Lord. So, yeah, in a world that seems to be increasingly chaotic, increasingly demanding, 
of our time and attention, increasingly providing ways to distract us at all times, it's easy to think that we are facing unprecedented problems, problems that might not have seemed to exist 2,000 years ago when all that modern technology and modern social media did not yet exist. And yet, here we find Jesus facing similar circumstances to what we face every day. That there's this infinite amount of work that he could do. And for him, unlike us, there's thousands of people that are begging for his time and attention. And we could easily make the argument that there are actually more demands on his schedule than there are on any one of ours. And in the midst of those demands, what do we find him doing but going off to desolate places and being alone, connecting with the Father? So let's take Luke 5, for instance. Jesus encounters someone affected by leprosy. And uh, I I know that last time this came up within the scriptures, there was a teenager who said, what's leprosy? Um, Yeah, leprosy is a skin disease. It's mostly been eradicated in our present age because it can be treated through drug therapies. Um, But back then, it could not have been treated in that way. It was highly contagious. And so people affected by leprosy not only suffered from physical deformation, but also social ostracization, whatever, social stigmatizing and discrimination. And so the heart of this story is that um, Jesus was able to perform a simple and yet profound action with this man. He stretched out his hand and touched the man. And we know through various forms of research today and even through our own experience and our own intuition, what a powerful and long-lasting effect appropriate human contact has for all of us, right? That whether it's between parents and children or um, lovers and spouses and friends and neighbors, physical touch, whether it's in a hand, hug or a handshake like we did here today, through an embrace and a kiss, whatever it happens to be, it's of vital importance for human beings. And to be cut off from physical contact is paralyzing. It dehumanizes us. And so it's likely that nobody, nobody touched this man for years And his body would have been riddled not only with this disease, which would have been literally eating away at him, but also that he would have been riddled with this inner turmoil that would have been eating away at him. And in the midst of all of that, Jesus reached out and touched him. And so we can only imagine the sense of awe and joy that he must have had in response to that. And in theory... In theory, that sort of action would have made Jesus both ceremonially ceremonially, ceremonially unclean, can't even talk this morning, um, and liable to contract the disease and pass it to others. But as with so many of his healings, it kind of worked the other way around. His cleanness, his healing power infected the man so that the man was not only physically made clean, but also socially restored. So the love and grace of God the Father flows through Jesus the Son in his touch that must have gone out not only to the guy's physical being, but to his whole personality. Almost like a cold drink on a warm, hot drink on a cold day, whatever it happens to be. But the story doesn't stop there. Luke gives us this extra statement at the the end, wants to draw our attention to where Jesus himself even got his sense of purpose and his sense of strength and his sense of power. That he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. He says it almost as though it's a regular pattern. He would, on these kinds of occasions... Withdraw to desolate places, uninhabited places, and pray. And now there are lots of ways in which we cannot mimic Jesus, because we are not the Messiah. 
But clearly, this habit of withdrawing to desolate places to pray, clearly that's something that we can do. And judging by how often it's repeated in the Gospels, one would think that maybe we're supposed to follow his lead. In which case, we might discover that like him, you know, we're challenged and empowered and equipped and given strength to find ways to bring love in action to all the people that we encounter. Because even though circumstances change, we no longer have lepers in our midst, still there are people every single day who need the loving touch of Jesus, literally, metaphorically, physically, socially, and they're waiting on us to provide it. God's waiting on us to provide it. And one essential component of that process is getting alone with the Father. And if Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, who in theory is intimately connected with the Father already, if he himself needed to spend time alone in the Father's presence in order to shoulder his responsibilities, how much more do we need the same, right? Back to the basics, simple little foundations. That if we want to be successful in what it means to fulfill God's purpose for our lives, to follow Jesus, then we have to take time to be alone with God and pray. It's part of basic discipleship, a good reminder, whether you've been at it for a long time, or a good instruction for those of you who are just starting your journey with Jesus. And in fact, I want to cite some other examples. I want to look at these other examples in the life of Jesus where... He would unplug from people and responsibilities in order to be in the Father's presence and receive some help. So that starts right in Luke 6, the other passage that I read. He'd been doing all sorts of ministry, attracting disciples to to himself, and then he says this. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he had called Apostles. So prior to selecting the 12, so he's already got this big group of disciples, prior to selecting the 12 apostles, a very important decision, he spends the whole night in prayer, which I, I might be an exaggeration, or maybe he stayed up all night. Either way, he dedicated all this time to that important decision. So in order to, so also in addition to gaining strength in order to be love in action to this person with leprosy, He also needed to be alone with the Father in order to have guidance on these major decisions or guidance on maybe even little decisions. This is what we read in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. Rising very early in the morning, while it was dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. Same word. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go to the next towns that I may preach, preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. So, get this. Simon and the disciples, they're frantically searching for him. He's gone off by himself. They're frantically searching for him. Everybody's looking for you. Let's go into town. Let's do this. And he says, let's not. Let's go to the next town. Because that's why I came. So... He spent time alone with the Father, not only for this strength to be love in action, but also this guidance, and sometimes guidance that seems so contradictory to what seems plain and apparent to these disciples. Hey, we're supposed to be here with these people who are clamoring for our attention. He says, no, I need to go give some attention to some others. So yeah, just yet another instance. There are other times that Jesus is then alone with the Father. So for instance... After a bunch of hard work that they do, a couple chapters later in the Gospel of Mark, he draws them away, both him and the disciples, and says, come, let's get away for a little while. And they go and refresh themselves in the Father's presence in a desolate place. There's another time where Jesus finds out that John the Baptist, has, his cousin, has been beheaded. And it says there in Matthew chapter 14, I think it's verse 13, says that he needed to get away and be by himself and process his grief with the Father. And of course, lots of people know about what happens toward the end of his life, that after he's arrested, while, uh, just before he's arrested, and while he's in this emotional agony and he's stressed about what's coming up, he retreats to the Mount of Olives and he retreats even further distance away from his disciples and 
prays for comfort, prays for some way to understand what's going on. So it's hard to underestimate or underemphasize the role that this plays in Jesus' life. And so for those of us who are called to be followers of Jesus, just to be reminded that if we want strength, if we want guidance, if we want refreshment, if we want space to grieve or process the stress that's happening in our lives, get to a desolate place and pray. And we could easily add lists of other reasons just because it didn't come up within the Gospels doesn't mean there aren't a whole set of other reasons, right? These are a few, just what I'm thinking about. Why else would we want to get away from some of that social interaction and some of the technology and whatever else in order to be alone with the Father? Well, to confront things that we would easily avoid. If we keep busy with all this stuff, we can avoid some of the most important work that we need to do on ourselves with God. Some of that is about examining deeper feelings, that if we're always keeping going, whether that's with work or family or whatever it happens to be, one of the things that happen is we never take a good look and actually address some of the deepest feelings that are taking place within us, whether that's really deep sadness or really deep anger or whatever it happens to be. But if we actually slow down and spend time with the Father in a desolate place, those feelings will just come creeping right up, right? And we actually have a chance to examine them and do something about them and realize why they're there. It also gives us a chance to sit with really big beliefs about why we're here and what we're doing and what purpose God has for our lives. If we don't get alone to be with the Father, just like Jesus did in Mark chapter 1, we might get caught up with what looks like good instead of what is best, right? The disciples were like, all these people need our help. This is the good stuff. And Jesus says that, he doesn't exactly say it, but he kind of implies Well, that's good, but there's better. There's better. And sometimes we need to sit with these big beliefs and get curious. God, what are you up to? And all that sort of stuff. Um, We can also get guidance on relational stuff that feels so confusing to us. And we need to get to a desolate place and sort that out with God. Um, And it's not all sort of pathological or negative. A bunch of that stuff is dealing with some stuff that's hard to deal with. Sometimes we need to get alone just to actually discover our passions and our strengths, what God's actually stirring within us and calling us to that could actually be exciting. And we'll never be called to it if we're just caught up with the everyday and not drawn into those places of desolation. So, yeah, all the stuff that comes up with Jesus and so much more, I'm sure you could add to this list. But all the while, when we get away with God, the point is to be able to go to the Father and seek assistance. Sometimes that's as simple as, God, help. Sometimes it's, show me, guide me. Sometimes it's, hey, what do you want? I know what I want. What do you want out of this situation? Or how might you reshape me and some of my beliefs and some of my feelings and want some of the things Some of the stories I'm telling myself. How can you replace them with your stories, God? All that sort of stuff. So those are the reasons why, both in Jesus' life, what Jesus shows us, and whatever we can add to it. Um, So we do it because Jesus showed us the way, because Jesus himself needed it, and because we need alone time with the Father. And we would be remiss if we would brought that up, this basic thing that we do as followers of Jesus, without also talking about the how and the what and some of the things that can stand in the way and some of the things that can help us in this process. So I want to talk a little bit about that. What does it look like to get alone with the Father? Well, first of all, it looks like a remos. Say that with me, a remos. Remos. That's the word that comes up there in Luke 5 and Mark 1 about being in a desolate place. Some translations translate this as a lonely place. I, I kind of don't like that because you, you go to this place not to be lonely and alone because you're never alone. God's with you all the time. So you don't go to just be alone, but you go to be away from other people. You go to desolate, secluded, uninhabited, unpopulated places. Sometimes that's just, uh, you know, in some isolated room in your house, your bedroom, uh, in the basement, whatever it happens to be. But sometimes it's taking a hike up a mountain. Uh, not too many mountains around here. Uh, Pyramid Point, whatever it happens to be. Sometimes we have to go to find really isolated places during the summer around here, right? Um, But that's what it's talking about. So when we talk about what does it mean to get alone with the Father, 
This is what it's talking about. Going to secluded, uninhabited places. Places where we're not distracted, I would say, both by people and by all the other stuff in the world. Whether it's our work or whether it's our technology, whatever it happens to be, there's a, an intentional blocking out. So what else can we say? What else can we say? Uh, I want to say this is for all people. I think that one of the things that we think about uh, that sort of secluded time in uninhabited places by ourselves with God is that that's the work for introverts to do. And there's nothing in the Gospels that says that's the work for introverts to do. Instead, Jesus is doing that stuff, and just, just like Jesus Solitude for us, solitude with God, is a chance for all people to be connected with the Father, gain all those things that we're just talking about, the insights that we need, and, and the strength and power we need to be love and action, and the guidance that we need in order to make good decisions. Everybody needs that, just like everybody needs the chance to come out to corporate worship and to have fellowship with other believers. There's different things that we need, and this is not a replacement for all the other parts of Christian life, including communal worship, but it is a core piece of it, and it's not reserved just for a select few that happen to be good at it. Some of us are much worse at being alone with our own thoughts and ourselves than others, but that's calling for all of us. Now, one of the things that helps me, I just want to say a quick word for me, is journaling. Sometimes when I just get out there and get caught up in my own head, one of the things that Henry Nowen talked about is we got a bunch of monkeys running around in our head. That, I got monkeys running around in my head. I can get alone and think about 12 things at once. And it's so helpful to me to be able to journal, to get it out, take what's inside, put it out there and say, God, what are you, what are you doing with this in my life? Whatever that happens to be, all the stuff that was just mentioned. Because um, lots of people, we, we know, hey, one of the things that we can do in our isolated solitude time is to read the Bible and pray. But people ask, what kind of prayer? And I think left to our own devices, we'll ramble on all this intercessory prayer and pray for so-and-so and pray for so-and-so and pray for so-and-so. And that's not a bad thing to lift people up in prayer. But we'll never actually, despite the fact that we're alone with the Father, actually slow down enough to let God do that deeper work. And one of the things that helps us slow that down is to actually engage in some level of internal reflection. Some people, it's helpful to go on that long hike or cut the grass for an hour. But one of the things that's helpful for me is that journaling. It takes things that are internal and externalizes and helps me, and with the Spirit's help, see that stuff and come out on a different side of the path. So that's just a word about how and what. And then lastly, one other thing I want to say about it, and we can go on and on. One other thing, man, we have to be intentional. It is so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to fill our time. Um, gosh, this past week it was so easy for me. Oh, there's another Olympic event I can watch and another Olympic event I can watch. Um, so it's not always like some terrible thing. It's good stuff. Olympics are fun. Um, but there's still a time in which to eliminate the distraction, and it has to be intentional to find the time and space to be with the Father, and we need to give that time and space to others around us. I know that, uh, you know, it's become much easier now that we have a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old in our house who are much more independent than they used to be, um, but I don't, I don't think Andrea and I, either one of us would say, oh, we gave each other enough permission to go and be intentional about spending time in desolate places with the Father. We could have done that much more during that time and could even do that now. Um, so what does it look like? What does it look like to create that kind of pattern? I know I've always been inspired by my friend Wes. He takes like a, uh, a weekly retreat that he thinks about, a monthly retreat, and a yearly retreat, all of which are escalating at a bigger, bigger scale, all of which are about being alone with the Father. Part of the inspiration for me in June to have a three-day retreat of my own. Um, so helpful just to get alone with the Father and process some big stuff. And so that's the challenge I'd leave all of us with, whether we've been at it for a long time or not. This is for every single one of us 
just that little thing about what's one more step. We talk about our walk with God. And we're not talking about big giant steps of the way in which we will make sure that this basic foundation is present in our lives. But what's one step that you could take to either establish or renew a pattern of withdrawing to desolate places to pray with the Father? And I don't want to just ask that question. I want to leave you with a, a little bit of silence and then I'll close us in prayer. So what would that look like for you? What's, what's one step that God's calling you toward to establish an even greater pattern of withdrawing to desolate places to be with the Father? Well, Lord, I think of any steps that just were named in the hearts and souls and minds and even written down by those present here this morning or those connecting online, I lift all those up to you that you would empower us to be people who follow you with greater level of sincerity and a greater capacity to actually live out the earthly missions that you've given us. I pray for those that need help in what it means to get to those desolate places and feel like it's productive time, that they would be able to reach out to you and to others for help. I pray for those that are already good at that, that they would be able to share testimonies with others about how that works. And I thank you, Lord. Above all, I thank you. I thank you that we have access to you so that we can find strength to be love in action, so that we can be guided at all the decisions that we need to make, so that we can process our biggest feelings, so that all these things, it's, it's just beyond our capacity to understand that we have access to you through the Son, and that all of us can come to you at once. Ridiculous. So we praise you. We praise you, we praise you, we praise you, and all your people say, Amen.